This is Bart Peterson, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Greg Gilchrist, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Dan DeMarco, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. The FCPA Compliance Report is the longest-running podcast in compliance. Engaging a wide variety of compliance-related guests and topics. Each week, Tom Fox brings you the top commentators and information which will inform your compliance program going forward. Join us again for the top podcast in compliance, hosted by the voice of compliance, Tom Fox. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode. And today I have with me Ian McDougall. Ian is an executive, the executive VP and general counsel at LexisNexis Legal. He comes to us from uh, the United Kingdom th- this afternoon. So, Ian, first of all, welcome and thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I'm normally based in New York, but since the lockdown, has occurred. I was uh, trapped here. So you uh, are very passionate about a topic that, frankly, I have not thought a lot about, but uh, I should probably first introduce most of my listeners are in the anti-bribery, anti-corruption space. And today we're going to talk about the rule of law. And while you may think this is some arcane legal topic, Ian not only is passionate about it, but he brings it to life. And more importantly, for the compliance practitioner, he shows its direct applicability to a best practices compliance program. So with that incredibly long-winded introduction, uh, Ian, first of all, why are you so passionate about this topic? This is not a new interest for you. No, um, that's true. A long-standing interest. Um, but the reason is because apart from being actually a lawyer who's interested in the law, which I know might be a bit uh, freaky for some people, but uh, but it's true. The other thing was the realization, I think, of how fundamental, how foundational uh, this is uh, as a subject, not just to lawyers and to the legal profession, but to society, to civilization. I'm kind of, you know, I can't stress um, the, the bigness <laughs> of this uh, of this topic as it relates to everybody and everything. Um, basically, uh, civilization depends on it, and um, and and that's really uh, I think makes it uh, an interesting subject, but also an important one. You know, I always had considered this from the historical perspective. In one of the articles we're going to cite to, uh, entitled The Rule of Law, you detail the historical background to the rule of law, literally to the beginnings of civilization. But what struck me about your article and your remarks were you tied that down to, I think the article was posted in 2018, but it's equally prescient for 2020. Perhaps you could uh, start with uh, defining what do you see as the four principles of a rule of law? Yeah, um, well, if if I can, I'm going to start just a little bit before that and tell you how we get to the four principles um, of the rule of law. Because, yeah, um, I think that's really important because um, uh, uh, I'm saying this is important to civilization. And of course, civilization is a big word that covers the whole world <laughs> and it covers the whole world, you know, throughout human history, uh, the history of civilization. And so what we did was we looked around the world to um, to try and find constant, consistent themes that came through um, all different civilizations, all different um, cultures and, and places around the world through history, going back to things like the Hammurabi Code, going through the um, Hindu Upanishad writings, going through um, the um, writings of uh, Islamic scholars in the Middle Ages, and so on, right the way through. Um, because what we wanted to try and find was a concept of the rule of law that was universally applicable, that wasn't one part of the world telling the other part of the world how to behave, um, because I you know, didn't think that that would be a, a successful way forward. And so that kind of then produced consistent themes which, which formed the four principles of the rule of law. And so those uh, principles are equality before the law, everybody being treated the same, um, uh, under the under the law, that's an important um, aspect. What that means, to put that into practical terms, is that no matter who you are, you get treated the same way. So whether you are the president 
or um, the um, road sweeper, um, whatever whatever you might be, uh, or even a lawyer, perhaps, um, whatever you might be, um, you get treated the same way um, as um, any, anyone else. So the important point about that is equality of treatment um, under the law. The second point um, sort of uh, is about um, how do you make that real? Um, so uh, the second point is about an independent judiciary. This is administered by a group of people who basically have nothing to gain by the outcome. They are independent. They are free from both political um, and financial um, uh, inducement or pressure. Um, and they are able to make a decision based on the evidence and the law. Um, and that's, again, important because that also reinforces the um, equality of treatment uh, notion. The third point is that the law has to be known some people call this transparency of law, um, but I try and use words which are, you know, really as simple as possible. And I'm saying that the law must be known or knowable. You can't be subject to secret laws. Um, and you have to know or be able to know what the law is in order to be subject to it. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, grave injustice follows. And then the final uh, limb um, is um, access to remedy. Um, I use those words um, particularly uh, because some people call this access to justice. And what ends up happening is that when you talk about justice, you talk about sometimes very political uh, notions. And we want to keep the politics out of this. So I refer to this as being access to remedy, which basically means that if you have a grievance under the law, you have the ability to stand before an independent um, judiciary and get your grievance remedied. Um, because if you can't get your grievance remedied, then there isn't really a law um, worthy of the name. And so they're basically the four um, pillars, if you like, of, of the rule of law. So a couple of observations. First of all, you're the first person I've known to cite to the Upanishads for uh, historical reference on the rule of law. So kudos for that. Uh, the second thing <laughs> was um, your uh, discussion of the Islamic tradition. Uh, I have to confess, uh, my study of the rule of law, while I had started with Hammurabi, I tended to go uh, westward through the Greeks, the Justinian, in that direction. Mm. But you really touched upon the, the not mm. only the vastness and the body of Islamic law, but its thoroughness uh, within, obviously, a number of different cultures, uh, even within the Islamic tradition. I was wondering if you could give a few mm. words about that. Yeah. Um, so very briefly, first of all, before I say that, I do want to agree with you about uh, the other traditions uh, that you mentioned as well. Um, by sort of listing examples, I didn't mean to exclude, for example, the great Greek philosophical traditions and, uh, you know, uh, all of the other points that you've mentioned. So I was just highlighting examples. I mean, one of the obvious and most clearest examples is that um, under the Islamic uh, tradition, no matter who you are, the um, uh, the uh, ruler, the emir, um, or the lowliest person, whatever you want to, however you want to describe that, you are all subject to the same rule in the same way. You have to do the same things, and that, in a sense, is one great, obvious, simple principle um, of the equality um, um, under the law. Um, that's uh, the simplest example I would uh, I would talk about really. So another point you raised is the difference of the rule of law and rule by law. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, it came about really because when I started to sort of give lectures and speeches and talks about this, uh, people from various parts of the world would kind of interrupt me and hold up their hand and say, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. We've got laws. Um, our country's got laws. Um, why are you campaigning for stuff that we seem to already have? And that was what I was trying to describe, a misunderstanding between rule by law and rule of law. So basically, it's certainly possible to have laws. I mean, that's, uh, you know, uh, most countries have them of some kind. And if we go back throughout history, you know, even Nazi Germany had laws. Yeah. Um, and and so on. So did you know Stalinist uh, Soviet uh, Soviet Union. So uh, you know laws existed, yeah. But what 
I'm talking about here. The difference here is that where you have a system that has laws, you can have rule by law. But the rule of law is the existence and strength of the four principles. Yeah. So, for example, um, where one or more of those four principles don't exist, yeah, you are existing in a in a state of rule by law. But when you have those four principles all strong, you have um, uh, the rule of law. Um, and that would be kind of the simplest way I would explain the difference between the two. What are some of the key reasons you see the rule of law is so critical? Well, um, it's fundamental. It's the foundation of um, you know, pretty much everything else that happens. If I take, for example, the social development goals of the United Nations, there are a huge number of things um, there. Environmental protection, um, for example, and um, gender equality and, uh, and all of these uh, wonderful and right things that the social development goals um, of the UN are seeking to achieve. But without the rule of law, they can't make any progress. None of them can. If I take, for example, um, the idea that we want to make advances in environmental protection, yeah, if you don't have the ability to go to an independent judiciary, be treated equally, and get your grievance remedied, there isn't really an environmental law to speak of. Um, it can be ignored. It can be overridden. It can be unilaterally or arbitrarily um, ignored. So you're not going to make progress um, in that way. So it's fundamental from that aspect as well. But also, statist statistically, it's fundamental too. Um, we have a great thing on the um, Lexis Nexus website, um, which is the called the Rule of Law Index Tracker. And what we've been able to do there is to show the direct connection, correlation between really important measures like per capita GDP, like um, infant mortality rates, um, uh, all kinds of different um, socioeconomic measures that demonstrate the direct correlation between strong rule of law and those other measures which lead to benefits across society, all kinds of different ways. This is really, really fundamental to everything that we build on in order to have some kind of sustainable uh, existence <laughs> and prosperity as well. As I said, um, you know, per capita GDP, the rule of law directly impacts and supports your pocket um, uh, as well. I guess the thing that struck me I had not fully appreciated about the rule of law was near the end of your uh, remarks where you saw – you see the rule of law obviously applying to the legal profession, but in a much broader way. You talked about corporate social responsibility. You talked about social entrepreneurship. And really, uh, to me, uh, you were really speaking to business issues. So I was really wanting to discuss that with you. And how do you see as the rule of law uh, as critical to uh, CSR, to business growth, to entrepreneurship, and a wide variety of other topics I have not really fully appreciated? Well, uh, I also want to say, because obviously I, I'm presuming your audience is going to be made up substantially of lawyers um, uh, who, who are watching this. So my remarks were also kind of directed to the legal profession as such and the, and the role that the legal profession uh, can play in all of this. And again, if you think about it, what I've done by linking um, the rule of law to um, per capita GDP is that I'm saying to the business community, for example, this is in your direct self-interest. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with combining self-interest and having good outcomes. And so I'm going to say to the legal profession as well, this is in your direct um, interest uh, to become involved in this, because there are a huge number of pressures on the legal profession that are uh, occurring. The rise of corporate social responsibility, um, the rise of social entrepreneurship, and the combination of the increasing um, desire of governments to legislate in areas that were previously thought of as being social response, corporate social responsibility. We have in the UK, for example, the idea in the Companies Act that the um, the duty of the directors is now not simply to uh, generate profit for the shareholders. The duty of the directors is to consider things like good practice. It's to consider things like the company's impact on the wider community. Um, and you have, for example, in legislation in India, 
where uh, there is a requirement for certain uh, companies, it's a financial threshold, to devote a certain amount of their profits on average over the previous three years to corporate social responsibility um, activities. So what you can see is that not only is it um, uh, enabling lawyers to give holistic advice to um, to their clients, um, but it's also increasingly becoming a requirement because of the legislative um, impact that corporate social responsibility is is having. Um, so I would say to the um, to the business and the legal community, don't shy away from the fact that this is in your self interest to support. Um, the rule of law, um, and also from a professional standpoint, increasingly clients are looking to holistic advice. The the old school uh, that you know, frankly, I grew up in um, was a philosophy that said, you know, well, this isn't legal stuff, so it's not my job. It's not my job to advise you. I'm the lawyer. I'm not your conscience. Yeah. Well, increasingly, that's not good enough anymore. And uh, injecting a bit of conscience into the advice is actually what people are demanding. Um, and very often, you know, if we look, say, to law firms, for example, the younger generations are making career decisions based upon things like, does this organization that I want to work for want to make a good impact in the world? And can I uh, uh, play a part in that? So there are, it's a hugely complex and very broad subject that says, we all have to get involved in this, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's also in our self-interest uh, to do it for a whole range of reasons. If I could maybe take that last concept and uh, put it in some compliance speak, it really sounds like to me that is a risk factor that companies, compliance professionals, legal professionals need to consider when going into a new territory, a new country, a new service offering, a new product offering. Is the rule of law available and will it be followed? Uh, could be a key key risk factor uh, for a business going forward. And we already know that's the case because uh, a few years ago, there was a, um, a survey conducted by the law firm Hogan Lovells. And uh, they conducted a survey of, I can't remember how many now, but globally top CEOs, basically. Um, and they asked them, when you are considering going into a new territory, can you tell us the top three that, that are important? Ian, does the message that you are evangelizing around the rule of law uh, resonate with, with non-lawyers? With a definition um, of the rule of law. Um, because um, even amongst the legal profession, you know, I, I always joke that if I ask seven lawyers for a definition, I'll, I'll get eight different definitions. And so it's very easy to kind of, you know, uh, take for granted that we all think we know what we're talking about. Well, we're talking about something very specific. And when I'm able to stand in front of uh, an audience of non-lawyers, as you are referring to, um, I'm able to, first of all, define it, hopefully in very simple concepts, which everybody uh, can get. And then secondly, make a direct link to the real world, as I try to do with the examples of the socioeconomic um, uh, measures. Yes, I find um, people's response is to say, oh, wow, we didn't realize um, this. Yeah, we, we do get the point. And then the final question is, so now what can we do about it? <laughs> um, that's the most common uh, response I get whenever I talk to an audience, regardless of the makeup of that audience. Ian, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but this has just been a fascinating exploration of a topic that I have to admit I had not thought about in a long time. I want to thank you for your evangelism on this topic, and I was wondering if our listeners wanted more information on this topic, where could they go? Yeah, there's a couple of places that um, I'd recommend. First of all, uh, LexisNexis has a uh, charitable foundation uh, called the LexisNexis Rule of Law Foundation. And uh, you can look that up on the on the web and you can go there and there's lots of information. Uh, there's not only information about the rule of law, but there are some good project examples uh, there and all kinds of information and news um, about the rule of law. Uh, the other place as well that um, folks can go to um, is the United Nations uh, rule of law site. Uh, and again, what you would see there are lots of examples of how companies in particular, because our project actually started as business for the rule of law, uh, you can see how lots of companies there actually uh, tried to uh, get involved uh, 
um, with the project that, that we started jointly with the United Nations, the Business for the Rule of Law um, project. And so uh, we managed to get many uh, companies in, involved in that, and they all came forward with really some creative, innovative um, examples of ways that they could deploy their resources and skills to um, help advance the rule of law. So those are the two good places to start, I think. Ian, this has just been a fascinating uh, discussion with you, and I hope we can continue the conversation. I'd love to. Thank you for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. I hope you'll join me again next week where I take a look at an issue related to the FCPA, Compliance and Ethics. We have two great new podcast series on the Compliance Podcast Network that I hope you're aware of. The first one is Compliance and Coronavirus, where I try to bring sanity and clarity to the compliance practitioner and the business executive around coronavirus. Also, the Compliance Life features one CCO a month talking about their journey to the CCO chair and beyond in four parts. Uh, this month, it's Ryan Robillet and has, who has a fascinating journey. Also, if you're a fan of Teddy Roosevelt, I have a series on 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership hosted by Richard Lummis, where we're looking at Teddy Roosevelt, his life, his presidency and beyond, and what its messages are for the leaders of today. It's a fascinating series. I know you will enjoy it, and it's particularly important for compliance practitioners to uh, take a look at leadership skills. I hope you'll join me again next week for our next episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.